Good morning. There's been so much talk in the industry about how to keep folks safe in groups that we've brought in some experts to help us through this conversation. We're going to hear from experts who can help with process, ideas, and tools to help us meet our goal of keeping people safe. Our panel will be run by the Global Biorisk Advisory Council. After the panel, we'll hear from Yates Enterprises, Accurate Printing, and Active Health, all of which have practical tools and solutions to integrate safety into your day-to-day -day business and processes. To get us started, I'd like to introduce our sponsor for this session, the CEO of Safe Expo, Matt Laws. Safe, Safe Expo offers pre-event, on-site, and post-event health monitoring services, which will provide peace of mind for show organizers and their registrants. Matt is gonna give us a quick overview of his company and how they can help us meet our goal of keeping people safe before he introduces our panel. Welcome and thank you, Matt. Hey Tim, thanks for that great introduction. Hello everyone, my name is Matt Laws and I'm the President and CEO of Safe Expo. We are proud to be the title sponsor for this session as we know the topic is so important for our industry today as well as the foreseeable future. Take a look and see what Safe Expo is doing to help the industry bring back live events safely. Resiliency. If there is one word to describe the meeting and events industry, it is resiliency. As an industry, we always adapt and rise to the challenge our line of work presents. Founded by a team of industry veterans and under the guidance of medical professionals, Safe Expo offers a solution for event producers and their registrants to help keep them safe and informed. Safe Expo begins each program by assigning a team of trained professionals that include a safety ambassador and a Safe Expo health liaison to assist with pre-event program development. Information from your event venues and participating hotels will be collected and compiled into an extensive health summary outlining the different regulations and published into an encompassing safety program for your attendees to follow. Communication with local health department will be coordinated by the liaison to keep you up to date on any and all announcements which may impact your event. On site, the health liaison will continue to communicate with all venues as well as the contracted medical professional who plays a vital role in the success of the program. The safety ambassador will serve as the information hub, sharing information about the Safe Expo program and answering any questions your registrants may have. Post-event, Safe Expo implements our robust monitoring program to identify any attendee who may present symptoms or have fallen sick after the event has concluded. We will help educate your registrants to understand the importance of self-reporting any illness or symptoms they may experience once they have returned home. If positive cases are reported, Safe Expo will work with show management to establish next steps, which may include a message to all participants, venues, and local health authorities. We know that staff budgets are not infinite and additional support may be needed. Other services offered by Safe Expo include temperature screenings and Safe Expo floor monitors who can help with social distancing best practices. We understand the strong desire to return to live meetings and events and want to help facilitate their return in the safest and most accessible way possible. For more information about Safe Expo program or to receive a detailed quote for an upcoming event you are hosting, please reach out to us today. Safe Expo, where events and safety meet. So welcome back everyone. I am excited to introduce our panel this morning. I ask our panelists to all um, unmute and turn your cameras on at this time. Um, I'm excited to introduce our moderator for today's session, Patty Olinger. Patty's the Executive Director of Global Biorisk Advisory Council, or GBAC for short. Just by looking around in our industry, you could see that Patty and her team have been extremely busy helping venues, hotels, vendors from around the world to create safety standards and come up with new policies and procedures for their staff to welcome meetings and events and tourism back to their space. 
Eventually, these venues and hotels will receive their GBAC star accreditation after following through with Patty and her team's training and execution. Um, Patty's going to lead us through an informative panel this morning featuring leaders from across the country and our industry that have experienced reopening safely and have welcomed groups back into their space. I'm excited to hear how other markets have also reopened how they did so, and how those programs turned out in the end with careful planning. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Patty, and um, you can turn your cameras off. Oh, thank you, Dylan. Um, I'm trying to turn my camera on here. It says that the host, oh, there we go. Um, my fault. <laughs> I'm gonna turn right. mine off. You guys are now the, the, the my favorite. And, and Gavin is in the, is somewhere out there. He's he's logged on, but he needs to be brought in as a, a panelist. Gavin McGregor Skinner. Cool. I will find Gavin for us. Okay. Wonderful. Well, welcome everybody. I'm really, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for Dylan and Tim for inviting us um, to be part of this and our host. Um, joining me today is Tim Olbert, who's the Vice President of Operations for Hyatt Americas, and Rick Simon, who is the President and CEO of United Services. And they are two very, um, you know, it's very funny in today's world where you feel like you could say, these are really great, you know, colleagues and friends of mine. And I literally have not met these two individuals personally, but I've worked very closely with them over the last several months. And then also with joining me is Dr. Gavin McGregor Skinner, who is a uh, director of GBAC. And um, hopefully we'll be able to provide you with some insights and some thoughts of lessons learned that we've had over the last several months. So one of the questions that I get all the time is really what is GBAC? And what they've asked is that I kind of give an um, overview as to what GBAC is and a little bit about the background of where we began. So GBAC really our whole, our whole emphasis is prepare, respond and recover. And it's not just to COVID-19. We really were put together of that whole public health preparedness and how you literally prepare for situations that involve infectious diseases, a pandemic outbreak, what you do to respond um, at all levels. And we believe in a scalable response, anything from what we'll call hygienic cleaning to that full blown you know, response like a chemical hazmat, but on the, on the bio side, as well as recovery. And you know, it's something that we are all really experiencing today at all levels and in all different industries. So GBAC is actually a division of ISSA and ISSA is the world leading trade association for the cleaning industry. We have to about 10,000 members worldwide and we're in about 105 different countries. Uh, the um, uh, GBAC itself was developed around 2014, 2015, uh, really out of the response uh, from experiences that several of us had from the Ebola outbreak and really collectively our, our, his, our, our whole careers look, working with biological materials. And so what we found was that, you know, my, my expertise and my specialty and Gavin is really in that area of public health preparedness, response to biological hazards, biosafety, biosecurity. Um, we had individuals from the uh, response industry and then also the cleaning industry. When we came together, we realized that we had gaps in our industries, but that together we really could start to, to close those gaps, focusing first on that training and certification programs. Um, you know, our experiences within GBAC uh, really range from a lot of different areas. Uh, you know, we have uh, members on the scientific advisory board that either are or have worked for uh, places like the Center for Disease Control, Health Canada. Uh, Gavin and I have had experience working with WHO, uh, universities such as Harvard or Emory or University of Nebraska, where they have the containment units that treat patients with highly infectious agents. Um, such as Ebola. We have individuals who um, work on development of international standards with regard to biological materials. I'm the current convener for ISO for bio-risk management standards. And so, you know, being able to then, um, our passion is to be able to then work with the frontline and, and leadership 
to be able to take that to really real life situations. And that's really where we are today. When you look at it, when the pandemic hit, we realized that we have real concerns. You know, we have critical shifts for the regard to workplace cleaning, disinfection, and what we call infection prevention measures. And this was really recognized because what we needed to shift from was that ability or what we were doing for a long time was really cleaning for having it maybe look nice and smell really good to that validated way of removing deadly pathogens. And so initially, like uh, as I had alluded to, we started out looking at our training programs. And we did a lot of training, which was really hands-on, more high-level response. And in February, we recognized that wasn't going to be good enough. The front line really needed something. They needed something that was going to be online and immediate. And so we took our program and we made the online training program. We've had about 20,000 people now to date that have worldwide have gone through that program. But we recognized even as soon as, especially as soon as people started um, shutting down, the first question was, how are we going to reopen and have confidence? Because people wanted to know how they could provide that confidence back to their employees and their customers. And so John Barrett from ISSA, our executive director, came to me and he said, I know, Patty, we've talked about you launching the program at, uh, for GBAC Star, which is our, our facility accreditation, um, our contractor accreditation, uh, this fall at the trade show. Can you do something for facilities sooner than later? And so that's what, where we came to in May, launching the GBAC Star um, facility accreditation program. Hyatt Hotels uh, worldwide, um, uh, working with, that's where I started working with Tim. Really, they were the first facility that came out publicly that said, we are going to adopt, and all of our hotels worldwide will become GBAC Star accredited. Um, worked, started working very closely at that time and with Rick Simon on learning the industry from the, the, the standpoint of how, how, how it really functions, whether it's hospitality, whether it's arenas, airport, transportation, you name it, um, on all aspects. Um, the GBAC Star Facility Accreditation Program really is there to assist um, providing that confidence, the, the trust through a third party validation. And right now it's all virtual since we can't really travel. Um, we've made it so that it's based on 20 elements. And if you're familiar with um, facility uh, quality management programs, it's elements that you would recognize. And really the need is all over the place from hotels to transportation, to travel, to tourism, to spas, to arenas, you name it, it's there. And um, it's always amazing to us just when we think we've identified all the verticals, somebody else comes forward, such as, you know, events like uh, triathlons um, are one of the recent groups that we're working with, zoos and museums. Uh, and so one of the things that we're going to talk about today are what are the, what does new normal really look like? And what are those challenges and solutions? And one of the things that Gavin and I talk about a lot is it's a partnership. And I won't say too much about that because Gavin really has been in the front lines and can talk about that partnership. We're seeing that visible cues really are necessary. And if you do surveys, you find that people want to see what we're doing from a cleaning and disinfection standpoint. And something that we all know, washrooms represent the rest of the facility. If your washroom is not clean, they're gonna start questioning everything else, something that simple. We're seeing choices in the facilities um, with regard to disinfection. Um, different types of equipment, electrostatic sprayers. Um, we're also seeing, uh, you know, crisis in, in, in encourages innovation. And from that, I'm saying we're seeing devices come down that were that are really exciting, but we still need to have that validation data that it actually works and provides the 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 results that we're really looking for. We also get questioned about, okay, when COVID-19 goes away, you know, we can go back to real normal. And we're saying, no, you know, what we really want to be, we need to be prepared. It's not that, you know, we need to be prepared for what's next and what may come that next pandemic. And so we need to be prepared in a scalable response. We need to be able to move from 
hygienic cleaning to a full-blown pandemic preparedness. And the concept of community, collaboration, learning and continuous improvement is more important now than ever before. So with that, I'd like to introduce, have, have my panelists introduce themselves. And um, we can start with, you know, one of the questions, um, what are you doing this year that you didn't do last year? Uh, so um, I'll start, Tim, with you. Well, that's a loaded question. Is it? Good morning, everybody. Patty, thank you for the introduction. Rick, good to see you again. Uh, Tim and Dylan, thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to be on the call with you all today. I'm very honored to be here with you and speaking about this important topic and how the industry is evolving. Um, God, so much has changed in the last just six months, right? From the time we started getting going on this. Um, I think that the biggest thing that has changed is customer expectations and meeting planner expectations as we move forward. We've obviously evolved quickly with the, with the pandemic as everybody in the industry has. Um, I think our training has increased immensely. The focus on chemical and procedures, uh, the care and well-being of our guests and our colleagues um, were important, but they're even more important today. Um, a lot of effort has gone into our policies and procedures around that respect. Um, and then of course, the dialogue that continues, we've had a lot more collaboration um, with other individuals and other organizations than we may have had in the past. Um, and then our policies and procedures at the property level in terms of how we try to socially distance, how we try to signal cues to people, um, how we try to manage the process and again, reinstill confidence in our guests that it's safe to come out and be a part of the world. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Rick. Good morning, everyone. Um, first, let me just say a little something about United Service Companies and what we do and our involvement. We're a cleaning company and a security company and a staffing company, and we work in a lot of different facilities like hotels, convention centers, airports, airplanes, hospitals, uh, public venues uh, like the United Center, Wrigley Field, and other places around the United States. So in working with uh, GBAC and specifically with Patty and her team, helping her develop the protocols for the disinfection, you know, is, you know, to go, go back on what she said a few minutes ago about safety. Safety is a primal instinct. And not only do we have to make people safe, we have to make them feel safe. If they do not feel safe, they are not going to travel, they're not going to stay in the hotel, not get on the airplane, we're not gonna be able to restart business as we knew it. So I think it's important that in addition to us actually doing the work, we have the visual to make sure that they know that they're safe. The third party validation with GBAC, with world-class scientists, validating that what Hyatt Hotels and others are doing is world-class service and disinfection. What are we doing different? Um, well, there's actually an event that's gonna happen in the United States, the first one that we know of, uh, the many size is the Fort Lauderdale Boat Show, which we service for both security and cleaning. So I'll tell you a little bit about what we're going to do for that because it's kind of a mirror image of what we're doing with everything else. Uh, we will be doing the nightly disinfection during the installation, during the show days and on the move out. Uh, we will be, uh, as part of our security protocol, we have equipment that we will be taking temperatures of the people coming in. And think of this as the equipment where many people can walk down an aisle and we can, uh, through thermal imaging cameras, take their temperatures in real time and not disrupt the traffic flow unless somebody is to, uh, seems to be over 100.4. Uh, we will be enforcing the face masks with people entering the premise. We will have people out in the show area with handheld signs that remind people about face masks and social distancing. We think the signs are gonna be a little bit better than it, actually trying to interact with some people that might be involved in a conversation. We might be perceived as rude, but the other thing that, that'll be different, if you've seen, you've been to a convention center, you've probably seen our people in our green uniforms. We're gonna put people out in bright yellow shirts that say disinfection team. And while they're hand wiping the high touch points, 
around the restroom areas, the door handles, uh, things like that, because it's also the perception. They don't see us disinfecting overnight using electrostatic sprayers, but they will see us during the day. Patty has coined a term called sanitation theater, uh, which is very appropriate. And I think at some point, um, there might be overkill, but for now, we're going to err to the side of being overly reactive to this to make people feel safe. Um, I think that's about it for now. You know, I'll, I'll piggyback a few things on what Rick has said and, and highlight, I think, for this team, which I, this group of individuals, I think, will be more helpful. Um, additional things that we're doing within Hyatt, we have issued our global care and cleanliness commitment policy, which is out on our website for everybody to, to take a look at. Um, we've enacted a cross-functional panel of trusted medical and industry advisors to help shape our internal policies and practices. Uh, we've implemented all our properties globally, a hygiene and well-being leader, which is a microbiome award training that has been conducted via GBAC um, through our e-learning system within Hyatt. Uh, we have a hygiene and well-being leader at every property globally. In addition, we have implemented a global face covering policy. Um, thankfully, that's becoming more and more prevalent at, throughout the nation um, and making our jobs at the property level a little easier. But early on, um, it was a challenge at first to get some of our guests to understand that. Um, very small percentage still have a hard time with that, but that is a global policy for face coverings at all properties. We have partnered with GBAC to achieve a star accreditation for all our properties. And right now, every property globally for Hyatt Hotels is engaged in an accreditation process. And we expect to complete full accreditation by the end of this year. We've also partnered with Deloitte and LRA, and we are conducting globally at every property, third party COVID policy audits to ensure that what we have in our policies and procedures are being implemented at the property level through a third party um, accreditation process in on-site visual inspections. And then of course, the education component, I can't underscore the education component with our on-site teams about the chemical usage, uh, proper social distancing, um, high, proper hygiene. We are conducting well-being checks for all of our colleagues every day in addition to providing doing temperature checks for all colleagues and vendors reporting to work every single day. I, I guess the list could kind of go on and on and on of things that have changed that are new and things that have been implemented to ensure the safety of our colleagues and our guests. Uh, but I'll pause there. Yeah, and I can, I can chime in uh, regarding Hyatt. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt that the Hyatt hotels are are uh, following the guidance of their corporate group because we're seeing the applications coming in and the actually the completion. And it's just, um, it's been a fantastic opportunity to work with um, the hotels. Um, Gavin, um, Gavin has been working with a lot of the, um, the team, uh, the GBAC team uh, going through the accreditation program. There's a lot of things that we're seeing and um, a lot of uh, need and that we're seeing different and going forward. Gavin, I'll let you introduce yourself. Th thanks, Patty. Hi, everyone. I'm Gavin McGregor Skinner. I'm the director of GBAC or the Global Bio-Risk Advisory Council. Now, Tim mentioned something really interesting. He mentioned one of those C words, and I come from a disaster medicine emergency management background of about 30 years, and we used one of the C words called collaboration. And in 2019, we would sit at the table and we'd say, who's not at the table that should be at the table? Well, in 2020, we're now sitting on the Zoom call saying, who's not on the Zoom call? And from an event manager perspective, when you're trying to plan an event anywhere, it's really important you get the team right. You understand where the risk is. And then again, through the, our GBAC process, we focus on risk assessments. I'm really sorry, risk is a four letter word. And it might've been something we, we did every three months or every six months, but from a GBAC perspective, it's something we do every day. 
risk assessments we do every day, just like Rick outlined. He's going to go into a boat show. I know how Rick's team work. They do risk assessments every day, all the time, both before the event and also at the event and probably even post event when they're going in to clean up and, 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 and dismantle the event. So it's, it's a way of identifying what do we need to do? And as Rick said, there's a lot of things and Tim outlined a lot of things that are happening. A lot of things that we do, we have to know that they work. So how do we help you ensure that you implement the industry's highest standards? How do we set up a system where what you did in 2019 has had to change to ensure, as, as Rick mentioned, a safe environment? And I think this is the biggest question we're getting right now from uh, anyone from senior management, Patty, to middle management, to the frontline employees of an event, uh, is that, is what we're doing work? Does it work? Are we protecting the, the building, the occupants, our employees to the best of our ability with the tools that are available? Do we have the proper procedures? Have we implemented the proper education and training? Do we have the proper, the appropriate products? Uh, how do, do we know how those products work as well as their safety data sheets? What safety measures we need to implement as well as equipment and tools? And, and then what I see and I, I'm, I'm one of the ones that, yes, I do live in my attic. I do live in my basement when I'm at home. I have to stay separate from my family because I work in a lot of hospitals, a lot of nursing homes, and I still travel quite often. And I've just come back with Katie Cook from our team down in Florida. And in the particular county we were in, they had taken a holistic approach. They'd brought the airport, the convention center. They've got the Hyatt. They've got the Marriott. They've got the Hilton hotels. They brought all the restaurants in because they knew if they were going to hold an event at the convention center, that people would go to the convention center for a few hours and then they'd go to a restaurant. And after going to the restaurant, they'd probably go back to the hotel. And if they came into their particular county, they probably came in through the airport. So their comprehensive holistic approach using what Tim mentioned, collaboration, they said, these are all the moving parts to hold an event at the convention center. Here's our risk assessment. This is the approach we're going to take as a county. And I think from an event, from the event managers that you and I've worked with Patty over the last couple of months, is that in, 20, in 2019, they were, they were really good at holding an event and putting it together and all those moving parts on how to make that, that event exciting and successful. Now we have to also add what Rick mentioned, safety. How do we hold an event that's safe? The event, the building, arriving to the building. And we help create that process through our, our GBAC star facility accreditation process. It's not a pass or a fail. It's, it's not an exam. It's the start of developing a partnership for at least the next 12 months to ensure that we can help you come up and use subject matter experts, both in industry, at universities, um, in, in other areas as well, to come up and, hold and, and solve these challenges, these problems that you had. One of the things that Katie Cook and I found when we were in Florida last week, uh, Patty, we had zoos, we had museums, we had art galleries, we had, had hotels, shops, we had restaurants that had all been open and the first question I got on day one was, is what we're doing, does it work? And that, and that was the question from everyone. We're doing either following the CDC guidelines or we're doing, doing what the state or the county did, uh, told us to do, but we're really not sure whether we're using approaches that actually work, that decrease risk. And we spent the next two days at our face-to-face -face workshop helping them get through the GBAC staff facility accreditation process, but ensuring them that what they did, their protocols, their procedures, what they actually did at the event actually worked and they had a feedback mechanism. They, they could start to measure that. They had indicators. So again, you and I say, Patty, all the time, what, what gets measured gets done. And as we start to see they could measure stuff, I went, wow, look at that. We can do this. Yeah, we're not going to invite 16,000 people into the convention center, but we can hold smaller events, more frequent events, to ensure that we help remove the emotional as well as the financial suffering that we've seen from this disease. We are moving into flu season. I know, Patty, the, the ISSA GBAC team is working uh, pretty hard at the moment with a number of subject matter experts, both government and non-government, on what are the challenges we're going to face with COVID and flu season? And how do we help keep everyone open, but do it in a way that's evidence-based, performance-based, and we can help you show what works and do it better. 
Uh, thank you, Gavin. Interestingly, there was a report that just came out that said that they are predicting that our flu numbers will be drastically lower this year because of the campaign that they're doing with the flu vaccine, as well as all of the all, everything that we're doing with social distancing, wearing masks, hand sanitization, um, really also support the, the protection against the flu virus the transmission. Um, you know, um, you know, Hyatt's going through the uh, GBAC uh, STAR accreditation. Um, uh, Rick has helped tremendously on that and will be one of, if not the first, will be the first um, GBAC STAR contractor, uh, which we're going to be launching here this next week. Uh, what, how has the GBAC STAR program helped you? And what are you seeing as the benefits um, of going through an accreditation program like GBAC STAR? Tim? I think the first thing I'd say is, is the collaboration to, to speak the word there. It's been very engaged with you and your team, the support, the knowledge-based information, quite frankly. We had a lot of skills within our organization, but I think the GBAC accreditation process heighten people's awareness and knowledge base um, as well as the hygiene and well-being leader training that everybody went through has really helped us kind of refine our policies and procedures and i would say this is the the ongoing dialogue that we have and patty knows this is that i'm always pinging her because i think every salesman on the face of the plant that's got something that they could sell it's either a sanitization a disinfectant a hepa vacuum cleaner they're all coming out of the woodwork and of course this innovation is great but there's a lot of stuff out there that you you have to kind of gut check a little bit and i think that that support through you and your team has been invaluable as well as some of the introductions to other industry leaders in this space has just been extremely helpful for us at a corporate level and a national level to really help us move things forward briskly and um, evaluate what's coming at us and, and back to the other statement of making sure is you know is the efficacy really there with the stuff that we're trying to do okay thank you tim uh yeah you know it, it the, the the innovation part i think you know, if there's a silver lining to all this, the innovation part is one of those things that to me is really, it, it's really neat. Um, it's exciting. I think that we're going to see some things that are going to percolate up to the top that are going to help us long term, but it is a wild, wild west right now out there. And I think that that's one of the things that we all struggle with a little bit is, is you know, maneuvering through um, that validation of what is really working. Um, Rick. Well, this has been a very interesting six plus months working with you. Thank you very much. Um, as I said earlier, this started out back in March with Patty and I. And um, for lack of a better term, I was kind of her person most knowledgeable in, in servicing a lot of the facilities we do. We clean hotels, both housekeeping and public areas. We service major events, conventions. We're in 38 states and probably 60 something cities. And what's interesting about that, and I think the GBAC has done a great job of, as uh, Patty and her team started writing the protocols for how to service a hotel. We told her how, what we do, and then she told us how we're going to do it to make sure that it's properly disinfected. Same procedure for the convention centers, airplanes, airports. How do we do it? And then she's telling us how we can do it better to make sure it's disinfected properly. As Tim brought out, every equipment and chemical salesman on the planet uh, has our number. And they're calling us and our response is, if it's not approved by GBAC, if it's not on the, the, the approved list, it does not exist in our world. We're not interested in speaking to you, but thank you very much. Uh, what I do want to do is I want to just shift a little bit and talk about what GBAC has done for industries. Uh, one of the things I was concerned about at the beginning of this was the local governments. If we have convention centers in all of these cities, we're going to have every local health department involved or every local regulatory agency involved with 60 sets of regulations to follow around the country. 
I'm very happy to report that in most instances where the local authorities want to get involved in how to reopen the convention center, the stadium, the arena, once we present them with the GBAC protocol, it's a very short ride to saying, yep, that's going to work. We're all happy now and have a nice day. It's really, GBAC has really streamlined a lot of the process for everybody that participates in it. Oh, thank you, Rick. Um, Gavin, do you have anything to add here? I think we've learned a lot, Patty. Uh, I think, you know, I had uh, 16 years of working with government and my job was pretty easy in government because I could just tell people what to do. And it wasn't until I left government that I actually realized that wasn't the right approach. And I think if there's one thing that we've seen as a community going through COVID-19, I still see a lot of uh, organizations, companies, people say, just tell us what to do and we'll do it. And I think, you know, as Rick said, when it comes to safety, you can't be told what to do. You have to understand what to do. And I think we've really tried to bring value to all these move, different moving parts, these communities on how they can contribute to creating a safe event, a safe building, a safe environment, how they can put in. And again, it's interesting that you mentioned, Patty, we saw a lot of people trying things, trying to do things. They, do, they wanted to do something. And, and they made it a lot harder than what it should be. And then they said, well, hang on, if we spend a couple of hundred thousand dollars or if we buy, spend just a thousand dollars and we buy this sort of equipment, that's gonna save the world. That's not how it works. And unfortunately, I would say over the last six months, we've, you and I, Patty, we've seen a lot of people spend a lot of money and they've wasted a lot of money because it wasn't evidence-based. It wasn't based on science. It wasn't based on data. It was based on something else and we found that when it, we tried to make it work in a particular environment yeah the technology is exciting it's wonderful but it doesn't work in that particular building or room that you want to put it in it works somewhere else so it didn't meet the needs of what you're trying to achieve so i think it's really interesting that we've seen this dialogue now open with doctors nurses public health experts with epidemiologists like myself as well as as well as industry as well as you know event managers and actually be able to sit down and discuss this is what the event's going to look like. This is where, this is how many people are going to come into the event. This is where, what, these are the risks, but based on a risk assessment, this is where we think are those areas that we have to mitigate or have a solution to decrease the risk. And again, it's not costing you more money. It's using the tools you had in 2019 and using them in a way that works for a 2020 challenge. And that's what's been so exciting for me as we go through our, our education, our information, our awareness, as we see people get empowered. And I, if I give you a real world example, Patty, I have a, a convention center that was about to put on an event a couple of weeks ago. They sent me their paper documents and I read them and for the life of me, I couldn't work out what they were trying to do. We all have these. And I said, guys, I don't understand your paper document. How about you get on the phone and do a walkthrough, do a demonstration, show me by simulating what you're going to do at the event and I can do a risk assessment on video and I can see if I can help you. We spent three hours going through their protocols and procedures and I went, you got it. I couldn't pick it up from their paper, but once we use technology that we all have at our hands, I said, now that I've seen what you're doing, make these few changes and you guys are going to have a, you, you, you will have a safe and successful event. Thank you. Um, so this will probably be our last question here is, um, and it's really a two part question. Is there anything that you are not receiving now that you still need um, and what do you see for needs for the future because as we as we come out of this pandemic um, we don't want to lose the knowledge that we've gained for the next pandemic because there will be another epidemic or pandemic at some point in time and uh, there's no magic uh, I guess uh, rules out there of how long there is in between you know I mean uh, from one pandemic to the next and so, Tim, I'll start with you again. Well, the first thing that we need and want is a vaccination. So I'll start with that. And that would really make all of our lives today. And I agree with you that this is, you know, round one of probably what will be many rounds over the course of our next set of careers because of the way the world is and how we're interconnected. Um, that I do agree that we'll, we should be ever vigilant um, and anticipate another pandemic or another episode, um, be it a reoccurrence of the current one or something new that we have not yet discovered or seen. Um, the other thing that I think would be very, very helpful, and I'll say this tongue in cheek a little bit, um, is a little more clear government 
direction and guidance on certain things such as wearing face coverings, um, consistency in our policies at a, at a more national level, I think would helpful be helpful um, on basic certain items that are just non-negotiable. Um, in addition, I think it would be great to have faster and more clear transparency back to Rick's point about the efficacy of chemicals, treatment products, and processes that we could have that were more available at our fingertips. Um, obviously, we would love to have a longer lasting um, disinfectant material that we could utilize within our hotels to help keep our surfaces safe um, and instill greater confidence within the public. Okay, Rick? Um, I think that you're doing an excellent job as the world turns of responding to everything that we need in real time. Because we didn't know three months ago what we were gonna to need today. And I can tell you, we don't know today what we're gonna need a month from now. Um, as these events, we've talked about it. As Gavin have said, we're planning it. We plan every day. I spend hours every day talking with hotel people, meeting planners, airport people, about planning and planning and planning. Um, and also, and also while mitigating the cost, because that's gonna be the next thing is, is how much are we spending to do this? But I think you guys are doing an excellent job of being very proactive on seeing what's coming. And when there is an issue, you're, you guys react instantly. So very happy with that. No, thank you. Uh, Gavin, any, um, any last thoughts here? Yeah, Patty, what we need right now is peace of mind. <laughs> peace of mind that what we're doing works and peace of mind is what we're doing is the best that we can do. And I think that I'm really, you know, I think the whole GBAC team, we, we're, we're very concerned of the emotional and financial suffering that we see um, through our interactions, uh, both at state, county and at the local level. We get excited when we see events start to be uh, uh, happening but doing it a little bit differently than what we did in 2019, but doing it in a way that we've followed the basic principles of infectious disease prevention and control through what we take you through that, that journey with GBAC star, but to actually see that it works. And I get so excited as facilities go through the GBAC star accredited facility process, and then they send me the video of their first event and saying, did we get it right? And I look at that video and go, oh, you guys nailed it. That, that was great. If you can manage that, more importantly, if you can manage that and be consistent and sustainable in the future, then you're going to actually help the country in decreasing the viral load and the risk of transmission. And I can see from those lessons learned that we've had as a GBAC team, Patty, if we can share those with everyone else and see more events happening in a way that makes them safe, then that's, what, 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 that's why we wake up in the morning. Absolutely. Um, I can echo what Gavin just said. I mean, uh, you know, for a lot of our careers, it's usually just a response type thing or putting in place a program in a very controlled environment like a laboratory or a healthcare facility to, to be able to then take that knowledge and work with individuals in a public health aspect and real life situations has been humbling and very fulfilling for all of us. And, um, you know, um, uh, uh, Dylan, I think we're ready to open it up for questions. It looks like we got one question so far during the session. So uh, from John Byrne, can you provide info on UV lighting? And I think Rick, you even mentioned some um, practices you're taking in the venue if efforts closed. If you, if someone could uh, touch that topic. Gavin, you want to take it or you want me? I'll take the first stab at it, Patty. UV, UV lighting technology uh, is really exciting. Um, so John, it's a great question in that we know from data, and again, our whole approach here that we've emphasized today is we are evidence-based. We know that UV lighting uh, comes in a different wavelengths, different sizes and shapes, but we know the wavelength that works and we know in the environments where it works and we know how long it takes. And so important that if you use UV lighting in the right room at the right amount of time for it to decrease or kill or inactivate this virus, then that works. 
Does it work in all environments? No. So based on our risk assessments, we take this exciting technology like UV light um, and we put it in places where it does work. The challenge we have at the moment, and I, I, I just, I, I'm seeing this in hospitals, especially and also stadiums and arenas, they're putting UV light in locations where we just don't have the data or the evidence to support it works in that particular area. So again, it's, it's not a one size fits all and we do this through the lens of a risk assessment. I would add in, I would add in there that, in looking at the UV light from a number of practical applications that we've had inquiries on, and in working with Patty and Gavin on the response, uh, as an example, in hotels, is it doable in a hotel? Absolutely. The problem is moving it around the room so it, it catches. There's no shadows. The UV light doesn't treat what it doesn't see. The other thing is in the bigger applications, the square footage. I had one major facility uh, actually buy a piece of machinery, uh, spent a lot of money on it to treat their exhibit hall. When they got it, they figured out that the max space it could treat is 5,000 square feet in about 35 minutes. Um, the facility is 2 million square feet. So we had them do the math on it. And if they started on the first of the month, they might finish by the end of the month. So that was not their solution. Right now, the chemical disinfection, but UV light does have applications, uh, possibly in the ductwork. But uh, that's stuff that I'll leave for, uh, for Gavin and Patty to f figure out exactly where UV light should fit into the solution. That's, that's a great story, because I mean, that's what we're seeing in a lot of things is that we'll see some technologies that have actual efficacy. And some of them, you know, the, the, the one that everybody wants, and Tim, actually, you alluded to it, is the um, surface protectants. We, were, we want to see a surface protectant that actually um, we can put on the surface and in between what we routinely clean and disinfect has a residual there. The problem is that it, if, it's, if it's a dirty surface, the surface protectant, even if it's valid, doesn't work because all of that, it's covered up. And so that's one issue. The other issue is that as of up until, I think it's August 24th, there had never been a surface protectant that had been approved by the EPA for viruses. They have always been for um, bacteria or molds and, and funguses. And so when you look at it, there was an emergency exemption by the EPA for the state of Texas for American Airlines and an orthopedic spine clinic. And that was, that was an emergency for a seven day surface protectant. And then it allows them to then collect data so that they then can potentially move it into a public, but it takes time. And so there's a lot of moving parts to this. And um, with all technologies that we're seeing, there are some neat things that are coming down um, the pathway that I think will, will stick with us for a while, but it's taken some time to get that validation and, and how we validate is important. Great, thanks, Patty. We have one more question from the audience uh, from Matt. Are temperature checks worth the time or effort or optics or should they not be used at all? Um, well, I, I'm, a, I'm a proponent for temperature checks in, in some situations, but to understand what the limitations are. In the event that you do a temperature check and somebody's temperature is elevated, I mean, there, there are always the nuances. I just came in from it's 100 degrees outside and, and you know, my temperature is raised because of that. And when you put your SOPs in place, you can, um, you can take that into consideration, let them set for a little while, cool down and then retake it. But if somebody truly comes in with a temperature, even though we, you know, we've heard and we know that there may be some people with symptoms that don't have a temperature or that are COVID positive, they don't have a temperature. If they do have a temperature, you at least know that they're potentially sick. And so it is a mitigation step that just, if you compile it with everything else you're doing, helps you mitigate. And it's a pretty simple thing to do. Um, Gavin, do you have any other thoughts on that? Yes, Patty. And no, it's a great question, Matt. Um, from doing working with infectious diseases for 30 years, fever is my enemy. And that's where I start to get concerned with fever. Now, because what Patty and I do, we take our temperature 
twice a day. Why? Because your temperature in the morning and in the evening is different. Throughout the month, your temperature varies. So this morning I was 96.8. And if I, my temperature increased two degrees from 96.8 this morning to about 98.8 by lunchtime, I've probably known myself, I have a low grade fever. I'm not at the 100.4 that CDC or a state health department or a county health department will say is a fever. I'm at 98.8 and I've probably got the first starts of a low fever. I need to be able to tell someone. So what we're working with, with all the hotels, with Tim and others, and with staff and employees, as well as guests and patrons, we have to start showing we care. And one way that we can show that we care is by using no touch technology to take a temperature, tell that person what the temperature is. So they know what their, their temperature was when you took it and remind them that throughout the event, we may come up to you and take your temperature again. But at the same time, it's not just taking the temperature, it's being cognizant of, the, of their mental health, their emotional health as well as saying, how do you feel? If you have a scratchy, scratchy throat, if you have a headache, if you have nasal congestion, if you have fatigue, then you can seek help at the event over here and you show them on the floor plan where to go. The same as when I go to hotels, you know, what happens if I don't feel well today? They have to have a plan. We don't just take the temperature and go, oh, oh, oh look at that, your temperature is this. We have to know what the realistic um, uh, of a, a, a realistic temperature looks like. I had my temperature taken at a, a facility the other day and they told me I was 95 degrees. Well, that means I've got hypothermia, I'm too cold. And I said, let's take it again. And they have to learn that that temperature is too low. And we're not just looking for when it's too high. And it's all part of what I call, and you can, you can make up a name for this anyway, but I call this a wellness check, a wellness program for both my employees, as well as the guests, the patrons that come to any event. And, it's, and we might ask a few questions, how are you feeling? And we want people to tell the truth because we want to ensure they understand that, no, you're not going to get set home and furloughed for 14 days with, with no salary. And we're not going to, we're going to actually ensure that we check in with you throughout the day to make sure you're safe and everyone else is safe. And all the attendees, when, when we worked with um, Hector and Pam and Terry down at Orange County Convention Center, and they held the, the youth volleyball uh, championships down there recently, they staggered the times for people coming to that event and they took the temperature of everyone that came into that event and throughout the event, but they also asked them a few questions. How are you feeling? If you don't feel too good, then here's the area at the convention center where you can seek more advice and get more help. And so it's not just Matt, the temperature check, it's more the wellness program or the health check to show that we care. I would add to that, that the, uh, everything you said, Gavin, is 100% correct. And Patty, the, um, what we're doing is we're taking individual temperatures, but for uh, larger crowds, we're also adding in the thermal imaging cameras uh, with a, a software that will take, we have it set at 100.4. And this allows us to, t to screen uh, in an aisle with, let's say five, six people abreast, walking you know, down a 50 foot uh, shoot that we create. So we can screen hundreds of people uh, per hour, and we, uh, if somebody shows up and, and they're screened that they're uh, turning red and that they're over that uh, limit, we have what we call the penalty box, and we ask them very nicely to please step over and have a seat for a few minutes, and then we manually retake their temperature. If they were to fail, we already have a plan in place. We've contacted the nearest local medical facility that would see these folks, because in a lot of our cases, we're dealing with people that are from out of town and would be very inhospitable just to say, you can't come in, you have a temperature and now what do I do? And they have no idea that they're from out of town, they're coming to a convention or an event. So we already have a place where they can go if they choose to go and transportation to get them there. But we will have them sit, as Patty mentioned earlier about coming out of the sun, you know, think about coming out of the Las Vegas sun and we're you know, we know that they're gonna be over hundred degrees. So we try and get them in the air conditioned area for at least a few minutes before we take their temperature. Uh, and then you go through that screening process, but it is important to screen them and there is a way to do it for large groups with a flow through, because that's one of the other big concerns for an event planner is the flow through, you know, with small groups, you can take their temperature individually. We talk to them, do you feel well, as Gavin mentioned, and those are important things. But if you have to do something with, you know, we have to get 10,000 people in, in a few hours. It's impossible to manually take off everybody's temperature. 
Thanks, Rick. Um, we are just about of, out of time, so I'm going to play a video from our sponsors. I'm going to ask Tawny to uh, post a link for our next networking event, which happens in about five minutes. Uh, we've invited some key members of the GBAC team to that networking event to answer any questions that you guys have. Um, so anyone is free to join. The link is um, up in the chat right now. You can just click it and hit the join. I'll just put in your email. Um, thank you so much to Patty, Gavin, Tim, and Richard. Rick, Richard. I think I'm at the Rick. I think we're friends now. Um, but this has been really informative. I have been following the GBAC team since I heard about Hyatt um, seeking the accreditation back in early pandemic days. Um, and I've, I'm really impressed with what you guys have done and what Hyatt has done for the industry as a forefront leader of hotels. Um, so with that, I'm going to play our video um, and I'm gonna slowly mute you guys all too. Thank you guys. Thank you and thank you. Thank you guys, uh, appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Uh -huh. Hi, I'm Dr. Yates, and I'm not only a medical doctor, more importantly, I'm CEO and founder of Yates Protect, Yates Enterprises. And what do we have to offer for COVID? I think something very novel that restaurants, schools, municipalities will actually love because it's here for COVID but even after COVID, there are actually a lot of applications. Let's go directly to it. We have it right here. This is a non-contact <clears throat> infrared scanner. And the way it works is everyone gives off infrared heat as we're walking around. This heat is measured by a sensor and then it lets us know actually what your temperature is or do you have a fever? The CDC recommends Anybody with a fever or a temperature over 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit is considered warning. You should be concerned about that person. So how does this work? It's very simply, you basically plug it in, not a lot of setting up to do. You walk within three feet. You can be as far as six feet away. You put your face in this area where it shows you where to put your face and within one second, It'll read your temperature with amazing accurately and very fast. Now, why is this important? Say, for instance, in a hotel. If you're checking in a hotel and you come in and they'll greet you, they'll say, hey, Mr. Yates, how are you? And I say, hello, I'm checking in. And they'll say, well, would you mind just scanning it? And I'd say, of course. And then all I do is put my face here. It's non-contact, so you don't have to worry about touching anything. It'll show my face. It'll tell my temperature. And if I'm wearing or not wearing a mask, it'll say, if I'm wearing a mask, it won't say anything. If I'm not wearing a mask, it'll say, Mr. Gates, please put on a mask. Now, the brilliancy of this uh, procedure and this object is that it can be used as a time clock. So a lot of times, a lot of hotels and restaurants, they have an old system where you sign in. That's kind of the honor system. With this way, it's no way to cheat because when you walk in, it scans your face, it puts the time you came in, and it puts your temperature. And this is stored, and all this information can be seen remotely. So you don't have to have somebody standing there working there, actually looking and recording that information. You know, and I think that's brilliant. Now, some people will say, well, why do we have to have something like this? Well, number one, we know from COVID, if people are symptomatic, the first thing they're going to have is a fever. Almost 90% of people who have COVID have a fever. So if you knew that, why wouldn't you want to check for that? The other way to check for that is with a handheld uh, instrument. Now, I'm not a fan of that for two reasons. One, the person who's using the handheld instrument is placing the instrument on your head or on your arm. And that's operator dependent. And I've been to a lot of restaurants and they just wave it around my face, put it on my nose, my cheeks, and it has to be placed very precisely to get the right reading. That's one, so it's operator dependent. Two, it violates social distancing. If somebody's this close to you, if I do have COVID, we're exposing that person to COVID over and over again, just doing that job. 
And I think that job is inefficient because it takes away a person that can be doing something else. And I also have to say, this is me personally, because I eat out a lot. I think the optics at a fine place of dining or a fine hotel, if somebody coming up to you invading your space and touching you with an instrument like that, I think the optics are not pleasing. Um, our device satisfies that. This is a sleek device. The optics are pleasing. When COVID goes away, it's still used as what? A time clock. It can, in schools, you can use it as attendance. It will take your temperature. It will open and close doors if you load it with facial recognition. So say you have, you know, it might be in the future used for your hotel room where you just put your face on this. And if your face matches up like a fingerprint, it opens your door. So that's the beauty of our instrument. I hope you've enjoyed what I had to say. And the next speaker is an esteemed gentleman, Mr. Mike Johnson from Active Health. And like anything else, he's discussing disinfecting and disinfecting wipes and sanitizer, which is also very important to the equation of getting us out of this situation. I hope you've enjoyed my talk. If you need any more information, feel free to contact me at Yates Protect. This is Dr. Yates. Thank you. Hi, thanks for joining us. My name is Mike Johnson. I'm a wholesale distributor with Active Health. And I want to give you a little bit of background on Active until we, before we uh, kind of dig into what we can actually provide to you and your company. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Active is actually, a, it's been around for quite some time as a manufacturer for medical, cosmetic, and healthcare products. And when the pandemic hit, we, were, we had the capabilities here in the United States to transform a lot of our manufacturing facilities to help out with the supply shortages. But we now moved our company because of our background into supplying that, uh, both high quality and very trusted products, both, both in sanitizer and disinfectants. But what I wanna to talk to you today is mainly on disinfectants. And with our main mission is, is just focus on placing trusted virus control products into your hands, things that are very trusted and very high quality. And there's a lot of questions that are coming up currently with our customers. One, kill time, how, how fast can I kill the virus? Uh, on a surface, how durable is are the are the products with the quality of the substance or the solutions, and most importantly, can I obtain stock? And as you can see with the the chart on the right, kind of gets into how retailers are reporting shortages currently in disinfectants, and that's what we're currently seeing, and how we're creating a promise to you and our customers on a couple big things on hitting these primary points and concerns. How fast is the kill time? We're looking at a 99.9% .9 kill rate under 60 seconds in our viral testing. Hospital disinfectant approved. And we're using with that a lightly scented, very durable wipe with no residue and no scratching. And most importantly, short lead times. We can get you product in a very short amount of time to supply your corporation, not waiting months and months on time. And that's where we're seeing within the reports is that it's not just COVID-19, it could be any pandemic in the future and keeping employees and customers feeling safe is that we're looking at the supplies and some of the supplies won't even return to normal until next summer. And that's the biggest supply issue we have right now is in disinfectants. So our supply solution is in, is in two parts, both domestically and in, in internationally. We have uh, facilities in Texas that's handling our sanitizer, but the Israel and our upcoming Naples locations will start handling all of our disinfectant wipes where our production lines are gonna be very, very heavy on how much we could provide to the market, not only how fast we could do it, plus how much can we get to you in one time. So we're looking at how we create a solution across all of it and providing some of the larger quantities in a very compact unit. And most, uh, most units on the, on the market are between 50 to 300 counts per tub or, or bag. We have pushed it to the level of 500 in a very small compact container. We're talking about eight and a half inches in diameter and nine inches uh, tall. So we're making it very compact, very simple, but also a high quality solution. And we do have all the safety data sheets and anything that you need in regards to our viral testing to ensure you're getting top quality. And these, we are just proud to be supporting so many different companies right now and who we're working with both on their corporate ends and their retail ends. And how our distribution has been simplified in working with you, we're providing to you as low as one case volume or even bulk volume. So one case is six of these tubs. 
Uh, it's actually a very light order, so you do not have to do large quantities to store, but we do have bulk ordering available and pricing available, which allows either LTL or full truck loads to your location or, or your supply chain. So we also have approved distribution partners in the area, which I'm sure you're familiar with North American. There's ways we can work with you and satisfy your needs, specifically supplying you the products that you need. So today we're actually providing everybody at the summit as an attendees a, a very good discount off the retail price of, of the small orders. Uh, it comes out, they're usually around 49 to $75 for tubs. But we're gonna get it all the way down to 37 50. Uh, that's, a, that's for a tub of 500 to come in a case of six that we're giving you $75 off per case by using this promotional code. And ordering is very simple. You can go to disinfectantwipesusa.com, just go through the order process, how many cases, and make sure you put in a promotional code, which will give you the discount off per actual case. Or you can email me direct for bulk pricing. So thank you for at least learning a little bit more about what we're doing to supply corporations, hospitality, and tourism to keep you and your customers and your employees safe. Uh, what I want to do is, after this, is at this point, introduce Tom Boyle. Tom Boyle is the president of Accurate Printing, who's actually going to share even, even additional uh, useful tools in helping keep your staff and customers safe during these times. Thanks again for your time. Thank you to everyone at Atima for creating the Virtual Hospitality Summit. Uh, my name is Tom Doyle. I'm the president at Accurate Printing. Uh, we've been a partner of the Chicago hospitality uh, community for over 20 years. Uh, providing restaurants and hotels, theaters uh, with their printing and signage, um, apparel, direct mail, uh, promotional products. Uh, but recently our company has evolved in response to COVID-19. Uh, we realize that employee, guest, um, employee and guest safety is at the forefront of all of our restaurants and hotel uh, clients. I'm gonna tell you today a few of the things that we've been providing to our clients that have been helpful. Uh, one of the first things uh, that we started rolling out with was our uh, partition walls and sneeze guards. Um, in the hotel world, uh, they really like the desktop sneeze guards. It's been pr provided an extra barrier of uh, safety and comfort for a lot of their guests, and it's been very popular. Uh, restaurants have been utilizing our partition walls, especially the ones with wheels. Uh, provides them the ultimate flexibility uh, to move around and as uh, guests come and go uh, they can clean them very easily and disinfect. Uh, so those are a couple of things. Um, they're easy to assemble um, so again been very popular. Um, one of the other items is floor decals which we see everywhere. Everywhere you go in supermarkets and uh, banks um, and we've been manufacturing quite a few of these. Uh, we can do uh, any size, any shape, customize them in any way you want, or we have a selection of stock uh, ones already completed and in inventory. Um, they're skid resistant. Uh, they can be cleaned, um, disinfected. Uh, we've also done many different shapes, like I had mentioned. Arrows has been very popular in hotel lobbies, directional arrows put on the floor. Um, so again, uh, these are tools that are, are needed um, to help navigate your guests uh, and feel comfortable uh, through your restaurants and hotels. Um, the next item is something that's kind of unique. We have combined um, our retractable banners um, with um, a portable hands-free sanitizer, and we call it a banitizer. Um, these have been really, really popular in uh, congested areas, high traffic areas, so that the guests can see the large signage, they can come over, clean their hands, and again, it's all about making everyone feel comfortable and safe in your environment. Um, so we basically just combined two products and it's been really, really popular. Um, Next is something that everybody has and needs, and it's signage. Um, you know, it's critical to uh, educate um, and inform uh, all of your guests on maintaining a safe environment. Um, and it's needed for your visitors, guests, vendors, even delivery drivers. Um, signage is helpful to reinforce the important uh, health and uh, information and, and safe practices, uh, you know, such as wearing masks or social distancing and hand washing. 
Um, there's all different ways that these types of things should be displayed, again, to uh, create a, a comfort that you're doing everything you can to make your guests uh, safe and uh, comfortable. Uh, and there's many different ways to do that. Banners, sign stands, posters, hanging banners, uh, lots of different displays and lots of customizable options for you. Um, the next thing is uh, face masks. Everybody is wearing a face mask um, and we've done both uh, reusable and disposable. Uh, we have um, stock designs already created for you uh, or uh, you can completely customize them with your own branding. Um, we've got pleated masks, we've got fitted masks, um, and um, it's, it's become a little bit of a, um, uh, a way for people to get their own message. Any uh, uh, businesses. So we're here to help with masks as well. Um, the ones we use are double layer protection, um, uh, washable, um, uh, reusable, and those have been the most popular. Uh, the next item is something called, uh, we, we really developed this, they're chair covers, and there's two different fabrics, an indoor and an outdoor. Uh, restaurants have purchased this type of a product quite a bit to, again, create more distancing within the restaurant and even outside on their patios. It's been very helpful um, to create that spacing that is needed. Um, so these are just a few things, hand sanitizer, those types of things we're, we're constantly selling and helping. Um, so if those are needs as well, we're here to help. Um, so that's, those are just a few of the products that we're doing. And um, you know, just wanted to thank you for taking time to uh, view this and review our uh, PPE catalog. Please, if there's anything we can do to help, um, feel free to reach out to us. Again, my name is Tom Doyle. My email address is tomd at accurateprinting.net. Um, reach out anytime. I'm happy to help. Um, so on behalf of Atima Media and Marketing, thank you for joining us today in this uh, session. Hopefully it was helpful. And hopefully you stick around for a few minutes uh, to partake.